Hey, welcome to Speechless. We're glad to have you here. We're live from the SCC studios in White Bear Lake. This is a live call-in show, so if you have comments or questions, please feel free to call in and give those comments or uh, questions. And also, if you don't feel comfortable doing that, we have our uh, email here, speechlessmn at gmail.com. You can email us with suggestions for the show and comments or questions. And you can see past shows at youtube.com speechless backslash speechless MN. So we're glad to have you here today. And just, you know, some other fascinating news about the Minnesota judiciary and what's going on in the courtroom. And just some of the processes that are taking place in Minnesota that are just, you know, a little baffling. Uh, so what we're going to see here um, is we're going to talk about a, a judge in Dakota County that I gave a lot of credit for who I thought was doing a particularly good job in a courtroom. Uh, and I may have to retract that, <laughs> and you're going to hear why. And then also, uh, I just sent out a letter today uh, asking to film for TV coverage for my show a court case that's coming up September 15th regarding a candidate for the Minnesota Supreme Court, Michelle McDonald, who's running against uh, uh, Justice uh, Lillyhog. And uh, Michelle's being charged with a DUI, and I want to film that case. And so there's certain procedures and processes you have to go through in order to film, and we will go through my letter. Do you think the press has the right, by our Minnesota Constitution and U.S. Constitution, to film court cases? Uh, I believe they do, and, but the court doesn't believe that. And so we're going to explain, go through my letter and see what I'm trying to accomplish here and then also see what, uh, you know, the court's going to do in this process. And so uh, we're just laying it out. Uh, it's happening here. Uh, it's amazing to me that the major media hasn't considered this option in the past. So and we'll also be covering some of uh, Michelle McDonald herself, her uh, speech to the Republican Party, uh, and her endorsement uh, uh, recommendation by Greg Wurzel. Uh, so, I mean, you have a choice for who's going to be your Supreme Court Justice in Minnesota uh, this year. We have candidates running against each other, and you can know, and there's very easily find out about both the justices uh, the, well, all four of the justices that are running so that you can pick to, say, to decide which one do you want. And there's no excuse to say, well, I don't know anything about them or I haven't heard. Well, you can find out. We're going to show you how to do that. Okay, uh, to begin the show, though, uh, I've been gone for a couple weeks on family business and uh, little vacation, but during that process I saw a movie. Uh, one was uh, America with Dinesh D'Souza. Um, fantastic movie. <laughs> what was interesting is I, uh, while watching that, brought my daughter along. She turns to me and said, you wanted me to see, watch this? Is this, this isn't what you believe, Dad. Of course, the beginning of the movie was bashing America and it was taking the position of and interviewing people who are out bashing America and gave them a chance to say why and then the rest of the movie was breaking down those arguments that they had as to uh, why they were wrong and the way they were they were thinking and fantastic movie I recommend everybody to go see it on either side you need to watch it even if you're an American basher uh, because you're going to need to hear what Dinesh D'Souza has to say and other people have to say in the arguments against uh, these people like uh, Bell, uh, Ward Bell, uh, professors at the universities. Um, so great show, fantastic. Uh, another movie I watched was Persecuted. Of course, that's being pushed heavily in the uh, Fox News uh, channels. And... You know what? Um, interesting movie. 
Uh, I just didn't think it was done well. And uh, I got to correct somebody's name on the D Dinesh D'Souza. It's Ward Churchill is the professor, one of the professors interviewed. And, and his arguments against America are, are, are broken apart uh, by Dinesh D'Souza. But back to this movie, Persecuted. Um, yeah, go see it. Um, I, I, just, uh, I just didn't think it was produced very well. Uh, could have been an interesting story. Um, it's worth watching. Yes, uh, interesting story. Uh, probably the funniest thing about it is this involves a, the President of the United States, uh, the Senate Majority Leader of the U.S. Senate, uh, involved in a cover-up of an attempted uh, uh, trying to frame a TV evangelist uh, for murder. And so that storyline is fascinating in and of itself. Uh, but the funniest part was the president was sounded like Bill Clinton, but looked like Ted Kennedy. <laughs> and I was just, uh, it, was, it, it was interesting. But, you know, you learn some of the political inside games that go on and how people try to cover things and have people do dirty work. Uh, for the senators and the president and uh, just how it could happen. And so it was interesting in, in that matter, but it was not produced well. Uh, matter of fact, I've seen movies produced by uh, people out of this studio uh, do a lot better job in the production. So I was, I was really surprised. But anyway, is it worth seeing? Yeah, I, I'd go see it. Take the Tuesday $5 matinee, get the DVD, but don't spend the big money. Uh, okay. Uh, also, we covered a judge. I believe it was in Illinois. This was a number of months ago. But this judge uh, sat in on a custody case uh, for a mother that he was sleeping with. And some complaints were filed against the judge, and they wanted to prosecute the judge and uh, fine him, this person, and sue him for sitting in. And he was declared in the district court level, anyway, that judges have immunity. Well, I would expect that in district court to do that. And you can't go after a judge for behaving improperly. And he was showing some uh, inappropriate videos about uh, his sexual provocativities <laughs> and uh, just a bad judge with bad moral character, let me put it that way. And this judge, um, of course, won this case in that, in district court anyway, he's immune from prosecution. Um, but I really see this more of a, he should have recused himself. I see this as more as an ethics violations of the judge that the, I, I don't remember what state it was in, I think it was Illinois, but this judge should have not heard the case because he knew what was going on and he should have stepped away. So whatever state's ethics board and a judicial accountability board should have gone after that judge for violating his uh, code of ethics. And um, they, they, I don't know if that's happened. So it doesn't surprise me that he has this immunity because it's really, to me, not something you can prosecute this judge for, but it's something he could be removed from the bench. But of course, this is why we have judicial elections. When the uh, government, when the accountability people are not doing their job in removing bad judges, it's up to the people. It should, the people should have the opportunity to remove these judges with bad character. And we get to do that in Minnesota uh, I don't know what it is like in Illinois or the state this judge is from, but w without that ability, that form of checks and balances is not there. And of course, we have that in Minnesota for that very reason to remove judges of bad character. If the people find out about the judges' bad character, we can remove them through the election process. And um, so, of course, the aspect of immunity can be appealed and this judge can still be prosecuted potentially for his uh, bad behavior and his dishonest conduct in the courtroom. But uh, it's going to be a long road uh, with this matter, and they should appeal it because I don't think judges 
and judges shouldn't have absolute immunity over their behavior, and especially if it's criminal uh, behavior. And I think a judge knowingly sitting on the bench of somebody he's sleeping with in a case, or, uh, presiding over a case for somebody he's sleeping with, that's, that, that is a crime. It's a crime of deceit and misconduct, and he should be held accountable, and he should uh, be able to be kicked out of uh, his judgeship and have some financial penalties uh, for that or potential jail time uh, because it's a high crime and misdemeanor, bad behavior. Okay, um, I got some uh, pro-life news here. And it's not encouraging, uh, just because it's it's part of this uh, industry that's going on with Planned Parenthood and other organizations like that. That, in my opinion, say they're out there protecting women and helping people plan their pregnancy, but what happens in the reality is they really don't care about that, and what they're really trying to do is get the abortion. And LifeNews.com, along with, uh, announced uh, or had this article that uh, an, a pro-life organization, Life Dynamics, released a report which detailed actual criminal cases of adult pedophiles who used abortion to cover their crimes. Okay? And, and the way they can do this is because the abortionists are supposed to report when a minor comes in and has an abortion. They're supposed to give some kind of record that there's a minor here so they can identify who the father is because they're, by definition, if you're 14 or whatever and you're pregnant, you've had a statutory rape, uh, in my understanding of the law. And with that rape, there needs to be a conviction. But let's say the person that got the 14-year-old pregnant as a 14-year-old. Is that statutory rape? I don't know. I, my understanding, there's got to be a two-year difference. Uh, but either way, most of these 14-year-olds are not being impregnated by someone that's 14. Most of the time, it's somebody that's 20, 40, you know, an, a lot older person. And what's happening is these abortion industry people are covering up these statutory rapes and not reporting them. So uh, Life Dynamics, Inc. released a report that went through actual crim criminal cases. And so what they do, it, well, in this case here, we had in 2003, Martin Castillo began sexually abusing the 14-year-old daughter of his girlfriend. Court records show he wanted to, he warned the victim that if she told anyone what he was doing, he would kill her and her mother. And of course, that's what abuse people do. They give you the threat, I'm going to kill you and your mother. And a person who's young doesn't understand the dynamics of the relationship between things because their, their life is not bigger than their own home situation and, and or their school situation. So authority and getting outside and understanding how relationships works, the kind of protection that's out there. They don't know that, so they're in that uh, abusive situation and living in that fear. And so he's um, threatening her, he's having sex with her, you know, as when she was 14, and eventually he was uh, having sex with her three to four times a week. After turning 16, uh, this gal was pregnant, and Castillo forced her to have an abortion. Uh, six months later, he forced her to have a second abortion, and a year later, he forced her to have a third. Now, this guy, uh, I believe, was um, 39 years old. Uh, where did I see that? So he, he was definitely an older man. Um, but anyway, for these three years, he was finally in, he was she, he was abusing, and finally, uh, they ended in September 
of 2006 when Maddie told her mother and aunt about them and then they notified authorities. So this man was convicted of 17 counts of lewd acts with a child and gave him 31 years and eight months in, uh, in prison. So you got to understand here that the abortion industry and those in the domestic violence industry, if they were really concerned about protecting women, they would understand this aspect of abortion and do something about it. And uh, Life Dynamics and some undercover investigation and LifeNews.com have been reporting on people going into abortion clinics who are 13, 14 years old, uh, and men going in there saying, hey, uh, this is my, you know, she's 14, you know, I'm having sex with her, needs an abortion, you know, or they're going in and say, young men are going in and saying, hey, what about, you know, uh, various aspects of sex? And uh, the Planned Parenthood is saying this stuff is okay. And, um it's, it's just terrible, terrible stuff that Planned Parenthood is doing and destroying these people's lives, of putting them in this bondage that will haunt them until they're free from it. And um, in that process, they're covering up the sexual abuse of women. And in the Senate last week, or Wednesday, excuse me, yesterday, there was a hearing on domestic abuse. And I'm going to show some slides next week or show some video of this discussion with Senator Klobuchar and with people talking about domestic violence against women. And this was particularly relating to women and guns. And in this process, um, fortunately, there were people there to explain domestic violence and dealing with domestic violence has to be dealt with rightly and straightly and you can't just accuse somebody of domestic violence take away their property their kids and and not give them a trial or a hearing and you can't just go in there and on an allegation say something has happened and therefore you lose all your liberties it's a <clears throat> bad, bad situation. So some people were there trying to straighten them out. But what Senator Klobuchar does not get is that this abortion industry is abusing women by protecting pedophiles. And she doesn't care. She doesn't get that she doesn't care. That's the amazing thing. That's how deceived Senator Klobuchar is. And if she really cared, she would bring up these issues of these pedophiles and the pro Planned Parenthood and get on pro Planned Parenthood's back and start saying, Planned Parenthood, you got these girls coming in that are being abused by these men, and they're coming in 12, 13, 14 years old, and they're pregnant, and you're not finding out who these men are to prosecute them. You don't care about women. You don't care about these girls. These men are are bad people. They're morally corrupt. Redeemable? Yes. But it doesn't matter. They need to be held accountable for what they're doing. And if Senator Klobuchar, you really cared about women, you'd be dealing with this issue in Planned Parenthood and the other abortion industries, uh, people out there doing abortions. And it's just critical that this, what they're supposed to be doing is Mandatory reporting, that's the law, and they're not doing it, and Planned Parenthood needs to be held accountable. And so when these things come up, Senator Klobuchar, quit playing your feminist, uh, feminazi game of liking women when it's only about trying to, um, it has nothing to do with women. All it has to do with the power. You know, I, I think you can care less about women. And, and it came through in these domestic violence hearings. And, and in the process, you care less about men. You care less about these men uh, who are in trouble themselves, who are, have reached a downward spiral that they reach the de depths of, of depravity and are going uncaught and Planned Parenthood coming up for that. It just tells me you don't care about women, you don't care about men, you don't care about the family that these people are around. Instead of raising people up to higher values, you're covering up for it. 
So that's got to stop. And Planned Parenthood needs to be held accountable. Uh, but if you just can't wait and you, you have to watch this video, go watch the video on uh, C-SPAN relating to uh, women and uh, uh, guns and, and domestic violence. And it was a fascinating hearing, and we're going to show clips of that next week uh, if I have time to put them together. But this is a huge problem with Planned Parenthood, and it's a huge problem with how domestic violence is dealt with in, in, in the United States. Okay. Well, let's get on to uh, uh, Don Mashek. Uh He's been a guest on my show. And let's put the graphic up of... Um, Judge Aspa, um, Karen Aspa, Dakota County Judge. Now, in my prior show, I praised her for, and I still praise her for that, the respect that she dealt with people and um, listened to them and helped them out and making sure people understood what was going on in the courtroom. I, I just thought it was Fantastic. And then when she dealt with Don Mashek, um, who was accused of um, disorderly conduct, and that was talking too loud out in the hallway, and he was charged, arrested, and uh, cited, and so he was there for an arraignment. I, I saw that potential arraignment, but it got pushed off because Judge Aspa, in her wisdom, and I think she was right, saying a Dakota County judge should not deal with this because the sheriffs, the deputies are in her courtroom, and uh, somebody from outside that courtroom, that court facility, should be hearing this trial. And I think she was right to do that. She treated Don very well, she was patient, and everything got worked out. And what was amazing to me, because she was patient, the issues got raised, Don was satisfied, uh, you know, the prosecutor may not have been satisfied because the judge made very stern warnings, you make sure he gets the video, okay? You have evidence against him, this is exculpatory evidence that he says, you make sure you get evidence and you make sure that that evidence is not destroyed. And, uh, and, of course, the prosecutor said, okay, that would be the case. Well, the follow-up hearing was July 23rd. I was out of town, uh, but the report came back from Don Mashek that uh, when he went into the courtroom, uh, the only purpose of that hearing was to postpone the court date. And Don Mashek had not received all the video of the, the court, of, of the situation, what happened in the courtroom, what happened in the hallway, what happened in the jail. Uh, and some of it has been said has been destroyed. Now this is something we've seen on this show before and the purpose of the, uh, the Sheriff's Department destroying and tampering with evidence is to get rid of the evidence that shows that they were wrong. <laughs> okay, we've seen that here with uh, uh, our past guests where Sheriff deputies have destroyed evidence. Um, 30 years of experience, hmm, at, you, know, you know how to handle evidence with 30 years of experience. And these deputies in the courtroom know how to handle evidence uh, with that much time. And they have their supervised. They know how to do it. And they know what to do. And there's just no excuse for these guys. And when they go out and destroy the evidence, as is my understanding, it's not there. Uh, these videos, something's wrong. Well. Anyway, so Don raised that issue. I, I don't have the video. You know, it's, I don't have all of it. And uh, there really wasn't much discussion and resolution on getting that video. It's just kind of like it's gone. But the big thing about this hearing, and I don't know why Don did not raise it during the hearing, is they did not ask the judge, who was not Karen Aspa sitting there, what county the judge was from. So. By the time they just set a future date, which now is later October, they set a future date for the um, arraignment, uh, because that hasn't happened yet. Uh, after that happened and he was waiting to get his piece of paper for when the future date was going to take place, Don asked the judge, oh, by the way, judge, what county are you from? And she goes, well, I'm, I'm, I'm from this county. 
And he, and he goes, well, Your Honor, uh, I'm supposed to have a judge from a different county. And, and the uh, prosecutor here will tell you that I was made very clear by the other judge that that was to happen, and that was part of her order. Well, the judge goes, I have no written order before me that that was to take place, and that was to be the case. And so what's interesting here is that Judge Karen Aspaugh may have held a good courtroom and been timely and been polite and all that stuff, but she did not follow through with completing the order and writing out the order that she said she was going to write and that she would get a judge from a different county into the area, which is just as bad and worse than being a polite judge because you then became unpolite, you became deceptive, you became untrustworthy if that's what took place. But either way, there was no other judge from outside the county to hear Don's case. Now, could that be a setup for a uh, judge um, to put this case back in Dakota County? Was this hearing just to get it back into the jurisdiction of Dakota County instead of a different judge? You know, and that's something, if you're not prepared with an attorney or don't know the law, could, you could have been tricked into losing the jurisdiction that you had at that time because you did not offer an objection when it was going on. In other words, Don should have, in my opinion, right away asked that question. When they were before the judge, when the motions were before the judge, Don should have said, Judge, are you a judge of this county or not? And that should have been dealt with then. And uh, then he could have cross-examined the prosecutor and said, didn't that order, didn't the judge say that was going to uh, happen? And then they could have set a different date. Well, and with a judge in a different county. Yeah, well, what this is called is malicious prosecution. In other words, if you look at this video, and Don has some of it, you'll see that Don didn't do anything wrong. You know, and there's nothing in there that shows that he did anything wrong, that he committed any disorderly conduct. Okay, he asked the police sergeant, well, the deputy there, excuse me, not police, the, the sheriff's department deputy, what's your name and badge number? And when that question is asked, the deputy has the responsibility to give the name and the badge number, but it wasn't given. So by the time they walked down the hall, Don, for the fifth time, asked, what's your ba and, and name and badge number? And at that time, the deputy arrested him for disorderly conduct because he was yelling too loud in the hallway. But was he yelling? You know, so it, it's just amazing here and uh, what's going on. But what is Judge Aspa? Did she just forget, not follow through, not get that order done right away? Uh, it should have been done, but it wasn't. So, uh, the jury's still out. She didn't do her job. She didn't issue her order, uh, Judge Aspaugh. Uh, was it just an oversight? Either way, it's delating Don Mashek's right to uh, a jury trial and postponing this case a long time. And, of course, this uh, city prosecutor, Dan Flugel, should drop this case anyway. He knows there's no evidence. There's no... There's no way there's going to get a conviction on this case, and it should be dropped, yet he's out there pushing it uh, just because some sheriff said it happened. Only he can see the evidence, and he, he knows. So what's uh, Dan Flugel, the city prosecutor, uh, for Hastings doing, <laughs> you know, in this case? But his name will come up also uh, because we're, I'm in the process of trying to film in Dakota County Courthouse the DUI allegation against Supreme Court, Minnesota Supreme Court candidate Michelle McDonald. And they're not letting me do that. I've already asked twice on uh, one different case and then also on this case to film uh, the, the 
uh, hearings that were going on in the case, and I've been denied on both cases. Now, um, just to give you a rundown on Michelle McDonald, we're going to see some video here, and here's Michelle McDonald being uh, endorsed by the Minnesota Republican Party. And we're going to play the first clip here just to give you an idea about who Michelle's about. And Greg Worsell, who's been on this show, who's also ran for the Minnesota Supreme Court, gives the uh, nominating speech for Michelle McDonald. So let's hear what Greg has to say. The computer may have frozen. I don't know. Or I surprised the control room. It's not working right now. Okay, that happens. All right, so we're not going to see that. Oh, I heard. It sounds like it's going to be sporadic. All right, I'm going to go on a little bit here. Um, and you just let me know if it's going to work or not. <laughs> okay. Greg Wurzel does the nominating speech. Michelle McDonald gives her, uh, hey, please endorse me. And she gets an overwhelming endorsement by the Republican Party. Uh, the people on the endorsement committee, the Judicial Election Committee, knew of her DUI arrest. They investigated it. I'm on that committee. We went through it. We studied it. And we think this is a bogus charge. This just smells of rottenness uh, by not only Dan Flugel, the city prosecutor, but the police officer that pulled Michelle McDonald over. And this is something that happens to a lot of people where you get this taxation by citation, but also false charges brought against you in order to um, cover up for your own mistakes. And unfortunately, this young police officer uh, made a lot of mistakes in this case and now is trying to cover up because he did not know the procedure in the law and Michelle McDonald, a DUI attorney, amongst many other fam family law, uh, state, uh, just, just well qualified in many areas of the law, um, knew what the law was about being pulled over. If you get pulled over for a petty misdemeanor, any traffic violation, you have the right to go to a judge. From petty misdemeanor all up to the highest level felony, you go, you not, I mean, you say if it's a traffic issue, you go, I want to go see a judge, and you get to go straight to a judge. They have to take you there. They didn't in her case. The Judicial Election Committee knew about this. Greg Wurzel knew. She's been vetted. But here's Greg Wurzel's nominating speech. Gentlemen, my name is Greg Wurzel. I'm a former candidate for the Minnesota Supreme Court that was endorsed by this convention in 2010. I had the uh, privilege of joining with the Republican Party in a lawsuit that went all the way up to the U.S. Supreme Court back in 1996, 97, 98. And because of that lawsuit, judicial candidates can state their views on legal and political issues. They can attend political conventions such as this. And most importantly, this convention can endorse judicial candidates. Now, Ms. McDonald is going to be running against David Lillehug with your, hopefully with your endorsement. If you are a member of the Tea Party, then I think you should want a candidate that believes in small government and government that is responsible to the people. Then I encourage you to endorse Michelle McDonald. And if you are a libertarian, a liberty Republican, then surely you want judges that believe in your rights to be free of government interference in your private property and in your person. Michelle McDonald believes that your castle is your home and that the government has been overreaching in its use of the police power to grab private property simply to increase property taxes. And she believes that the federal courts have been delinquent and haven't been protecting the, the rights of the citizens against unreasonable searches and seizures. And she believes that 
we must use the state constitution and our state courts to protect those rights. And if you, and if you are a social conservative, then I want to bring to your attention that there is no affront so severe against the right of life as the current order that exists where the Minnesota Supreme Court requires each of us as taxpayers to pay for abortions. I urge you to endorse a pro-life candidate for the Minnesota Supreme Court, Michelle McDonald. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, if you believe in the Constitution, and if you want to stop judicial activism, then you need to endorse Michelle McDonald. Now some say that Michelle has been controversial in the past because she's gotten into arguments with judges because, well, they failed to uphold your rights. Well, you know what I say? That's just the kind of person we need on the court. I nominate Michelle McDonald because she is a strong woman and she's a strong conservative, and she is going to fight and fight and fight. I give you your next justice to the Minnesota Supreme Court, Michelle McDonald. Well, what's, what's really interesting here is that this part of Greg's Wurschel's speech about unreasonable searches and seizures, Michelle McDonald knows about that. She knows what's going on and has had her own experiences in how the government violates our Constitution and how uh, governmental authorities will abuse their power. She understands that and she knows how it happens. So she won't be bamboozled or tricked or uh, you know her agenda is to preserving your constitutional right. That's all right to have that agenda as a judge. That's what you swear an oath to. I will uphold the Constitution of the United States and Minnesota and the laws. Okay, as, as long as those laws follow the Constitution. And she understands that, and she knows the law, and she's going to fight for that. And I know, and I have many friends out there in the African American community that understand this. And you should walk away from a DFL uh, hack like David Lillyhog because he doesn't care about you. Okay, Michelle McDonald does. And she cares about your rights. She knows what you're going through with driving while black. Although she's not black, she understands what police officers do and knows how they do it. She won't be bamboozled by the fake trickery and words that are used, and she won't be going out like some of our justices do. In my opinion, David Lillyhog and uh, uh, Barry Anderson and Lori Gilday, and mix the words around just to come up with the meaning that they want when there's a plain meaning on this, uh, on, on the Constitution and the law. Just to twist things to get their, get their way. I don't see that she's that way. Okay, so I thought uh, um, Craig Wurzel did a great speech. And Republican or Democrat, she's the kind of person you want, would want as your judge. She's thorough in her research, knows her stuff, and is going to do what's right. Okay, we got a phone call coming in. So, caller, do you have a comment or question? Tim Kinley, good show this evening. Thank My you. My question is, have you been following this Al Flowers affair over in Minneapolis? Because I can't really put it all together. I see on the TV news, commercial TV news like WCCO, you have the chief of police and the new mayor, Betsy Hodges, they're frustrated. They said, we can't comment, we're frustrated. Give us a chance, we're frustrated. Now, I know that um, What are they Betsy frustrated Hodges, with? Yeah, that's a lot of empty words there, absolutely. That Betsy Hodges, of course, you know, she was the favorite of the Star Tribune. They promoted her right. to get her elected. We know that uh, her husband, he is on the Met Council, he is, you know, uh, he, to get on the Met Council, of course, you have to be appointed by the governor. So you have to be right. working for the governor. Right. And so he's an African-American guy. Right. And he's had and I've met uh, him. Uh, the 
livable communities, com- community development uh, committee of the Met Council. And, of course, he was excited to uh, big, bring a big grant, bring grant to the uh, put, uh, government uh, housing project there on the old uh, Airport Bowl site. He's uh, excited about uh, the Betsy, money they were Betsy going. Hodges' now, husband? Right. Yeah, okay. Yeah. And so my question is, uh, you would think that she would be empathetic towards Al Flowers. You know, he's a 55-year-old guy who the cops come into his house, and he has to see, uh, you know, the warrant, and they beat him up. And they, why, why can't she just deal it? What's the struggle? I mean, why, I mean, I have to believe her husband, uh, you know, from Minneapolis, he understands what's going on. Can he explain it to her, or, or what's the trouble? Why is the only word they can get out of their mouth is, we're frustrated. Why can't they say, we'll send this to the court system and get this to, uh, dealt with? Thanks, Tim. Well, I, obviously they can't comment, but uh, their positioning is, is favoring the police, like they have some inside information. Uh, so obviously the police aren't telling the whole story, and neither are they because they think they have... Uh, uh, While well, they just have information that they can't tell and what deals with personnel. Uh, but obviously, Al Flowers knows how to behave. <laughs> I mean, I, I've met him. Uh, he knows how to behave in a police situation. He knows what to say and what not to say. He knows his rights. For them to come in and say, I don't have to show you a warrant, he's got no right to be, they have no right to be in that house without a warrant. Okay, and they could have thrown it at him. They could have done whatever. There's the warrant, and so that Al could have read it. But Al wasn't the one being arrested; it was his daughter. And it, but he's got a right. The police have no right to be in his home without a warrant, a written warrant. And so, what's interesting is the police are saying, and I and I see this happen because in the McDonald case when she was. Michelle McDonald running for the Minnesota Supreme Court. When she was charged with disorderly conduct, a judge issued an oral warrant. You can't do that. And it's the same. So it had to be written, and it would have had to have been handed to Michelle McDonald. They could have arrested her first and then handed it to her, but it had to be there. And the same thing with Al Flowers. There needed to be an arrest. There needed to be a warrant, and it should have been handed to Al Flowers because they were coming into his house. She's here get the warrant, and hand it to them. They knew where she was, and they had more than enough time to get it done. But they didn't do it. And so Al had every right to protest. He had no right to resist, but was he resisting? I don't think he was resisting. You're not resisting if you're enforcing your constitutional rights. That's not resisting arrest. Okay, and this is what this whole case is going to rest on, and Al Flowers is going to get a whole bunch more money, and the Minneapolis police um, are in a bad spot in this case. Um, it will be interesting to see what happens. But, uh, caller, way to get us off subject. <laughs> Had nothing to do with what we're talking about. But here I will say the aspect of uh, the issue is the warrant, and why are the police saying they didn't need a warrant, didn't have to have it on there, and didn't have to give it to uh, Al Flowers, uh, but there was a warrant out there, and when you break into somebody's house, you have to have a warrant. This is not a uh, in hot pursuit of. This was not a hot pursuit. This was an ongoing thing, and a hot pursuit has to be within 24 hours type of thing of something that just happened that the police saw, and this, that did not happen here. Okay, uh, so before and if we get to the spot where we show this, uh, Michelle McDonald's uh, nominating er, her speech for trying to get endorsement to the Republican Party, uh, I have requested, and I got this letter here, that I wrote to Chief Judge Terrence E. Conkle of Dakota County, or excuse me, of the, uh, he's of McCloyd County, but he's the Chief Judge of the 1st Judicial District, and uh, I'm, I'm asking to film. So he's the Chief Judge. The judge in this case is, uh, that's presiding over it is Leslie Metzen. 
She is one of these star judges, there's retired judges. She's been brought in especially for Michelle McDonald and this was before she was running for the Supreme Court. And Leslie Metzen also handled the case when Michelle McDonald was charged with disorderly conduct. Judge Metzen said there was no probable cause for the sheriffs to arrest uh, Les, uh, Michelle McDonald and they shouldn't have done it and no probable cause so the case was dismissed and Michelle ended up being abused significantly by the sheriffs in, in that process and the vi part of the video is out uh, hopefully we'll get the rest of it uh, but some of it has been collected by Data Protection or Data Practices Act so some of the video is out but not all of it is out because I don't know but we'll get it uh, we'll, by the time it can be released the whole video because of the the uh, court case they can't release it all so they say so here's my letter to Judge Conco I'm requesting to film Dakota County District Court case 19 HA CR 13 1371 State versus Michelle McDonald Shimota on September 15 2014 before retired judge Leslie Metzen at 1560 Highway 54 Hastings Minnesota 50 uh, zip code 55033 uh, that's the Dakota County Courthouse I would like to rem mind you of the US constitutional provision of the First Amendment which delineates the freedom of the press which delineates the freedom of the press as an unalienable right okay also the Minnesota Constitution in article 1 section 3 liberty of the press states the liberty of the press shall forever remain inviolate can't violate that the press has the liberty. Okay. And my press form is audio and video. That's what I do. I go out and take pictures and audio of events that take place. I take audio and video of court cases and play them on my TV show and on the internet. And I've filmed the Minnesota Supreme Court. I've filmed the appellate courts. I've filmed outside district courts. Federal courts won't let me in. District courts have not let me in so far. Okay. Also, under Minnesota Constitution, Article 1, Section 3, right, rights of the accused in criminal prosecution states, in all criminal prosecutions, the accused shall enjoy the right to public, a public trial. Public trial. And then it goes on to say, by a 12-member jury well the que the question here and this could be a little little dicey one way or the other but it's a public trial but that public trial is by a 12 member jury so i read this as a separation public trial is part and since it's criminal 12 member jury okay and then it goes on to state but the legislature may have different numbers for non-criminal type trials. It could be, you know, and the legislature has established uh, six-member juries in various situations. But my point is it's a public trial. And if Michelle McDonald wants to have that trial shown, she has the right for that to be on TV and be in the press because she has a right to a public trial. Okay, and I have the right to the freedom of the press. And you have the right to see that. You can go down there, but because of the press, you can read about the article in the paper, or you can watch it on TV. That's the freedom of the press. And so, and then I write, I know no other way to make a trial more public than by having it filmed. <laughs> okay. Um, and I didn't go in here in the case of the US Supreme Court that said, well, you know, the, the big issue here on the public trial is that you could um, jeopardize a fair trial by having TV cameras in the courtroom and they're, and they're so bulky and noisy and, and it would distract from the trial. 
That's a legitimate point on the distraction from the tri trial, but that was the U.S. Supreme Court, and that was done when cameras made noise. Can you imagine somebody, you know, winding the camera while the trial's going on and having this big, bulky equipment? Well, now you can go in a courtroom with your cell phone, <clears throat> and they're quiet, okay? Uh, you wouldn't know, but it'd be a distraction. But to have one camera sit in the courtroom, Matter of fact, there's a camera in every Dakota County courtroom. It's already there. And we'll, we'll show you pictures next time of the cameras in the courtroom. So the cameras are already there. Pictures are being taken. The issue is the press doesn't get it. The press can't show what's going on. But through data practices, you can go and get some of this video. Uh, and so uh, other, other judges are playing to the video cameras. The Supreme Court is, but not the district court. The appellate courts are, not the district court. Some states allow it, other states don't. The big thing is this hasn't been pushed to the U.S. Supreme Court. Okay, I have a TV show called Speechless that covers court issues on Comcast Channel 15 that plays out of the SEC studios in White Bear Lake, Minnesota. My show plays in many cities throughout the state of Minnesota. I copied this letter to the other parties in this case for their response. Please respond to my request in one week by August 8, 2014. So this has been mailed out today and uh, I copied to Michelle McDonald's attorney, I copied to Dan Flugel, the city prosecutor, who was also the prosecutor on the Don Meshek case that I talked about earlier. Uh, both these cases should be thrown out. The prosecutor should not be prosecuting. He knows there's no evidence. He knows she's piled on. There was no charges brought against Michelle McDonald uh, when she was taken into the, the uh, police station. Uh, no charges was released. Uh, a day later, she filed a complaint uh, about the police officer's conduct. Two days later, five charges, criminal charges came against Michelle McDonald. So this retaliation. Uh, and one of those was failing to take a breathalyzer. No breathalyzer was even offered. This is a sham. Dan Flugel and these police officers should be embarrassed about what they're doing, and they should hold these police officers. And Dan Flugel needs to be held accountable for what he's doing. And this was also set to Leslie Metz and the judge on the case. So hopefully I'll have a response uh, by next Friday. Uh, I've already been turned down in this case for another part of the hearing. Uh, and the reason I was turned down is because the prosecutor didn't want it to be filmed. Now, according to court rules, not according to our Constitution, but according to court rules, district court doesn't have to be filmed. But it can be filmed if the prosecutor, the defendant, and the judge agree to have it filmed. But the judge can overrule the defendant and the prosecutor. What the judge told me was, well, the prosecutor didn't want it to be filmed, so therefore we're not going to allow you to film. But the judge could have overruled that. The real issue is the judge didn't want to be filmed. If the judge was an honest judge, understood the Minnesota Constitution, she would say, film it, whether the prosecutor wants it done or not. If the defendant doesn't care, who else should care? Nobody else should care. That's the big person, the person being charged. They don't care. So that's uh, an amazing aspect to this case that's going on. Well, again, thanks for watching the show. Um, you can call in with your comments or questions. Again, you can email me. We've got a phone call coming here. So, caller, we've got uh, a very little bit of time left. Uh, but what's your comment or question? And, Kim Kinley, you say that they are... They have video cameras in Dakota County courtrooms. Are yes. they telling you whether they're uh, recording anything on those cameras? Thank you. Uh, video for certain, yes, absolutely. A every court session, in the hallways, at all times, there's video going camera in, the, in, in that uh, courthouse all the time. Audio, I don't know. Uh, video, definitely. And it's happening in the courthouse, in the hallways, in the uh, jail cells, the holding cells, 
Um, as we'll see next week on the show, we'll show uh, Michelle McDonald being taken out of the courtroom, uh, being in a wheelchair, being in her uh, holding cell. You'll see all that, and um, it's, you know it's it's being done. And I right now I assume that that's happening in every courtroom in in Minnesota, and I'm glad it's happening. It needs to happen. What needs to happen further is the press to have the right to this video uh, freely and be able to also videotape these hearings uh, because the public has the right to know, like they know their executive branch, like they know their legislation and the Congress, um, they get to see the hearings, hear the hearings, it's all accessible to them through C-SPAN and uh, even in Minnesota we have the websites, we have the TV channel, you can see it and you can go down there and you can film, it's all wide open but not our courtrooms, which just baffles me how the courts who are so upright and just don't understand their own constitution and aren't willing to follow by it. Uh, it's amazing to me. And all, really, it's all about protecting themselves uh, and having the secret society. All right, folks, thanks for watching the show. Uh, we'll see you next week where we're going to discuss this domestic abuse and have some of this video of Michelle McDonald, the domestic abuse hearing in the U.S. Senate uh, with Amy Klobuchar. All right, uh, remember, if you don't stand up for other people's liberties, who's going to stand up for yours? And good men don't do nothing. God bless. Have a great week.